All right. It's good to be with you, church. We're going to be continuing our study through the book of Ephesians today. Ephesians is a book about the church. It's about who and what the church of God is. And so we saw Paul opening up this letter to the church at Ephesus with this traditional greeting in verses 1 and 2. Uh, but right after he says hello, essentially, he just kind of just goes off. He basically just word vomits on us. Uh, that's, that's what he's doing. Have you ever run into somebody like that where they have such good news, they want you to know something so badly that they, say, hey, they see you, they say hi, and they just rah, 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 just, just all over you, you know? They just kind of go off on you. Well, that's what Paul is doing here. In fact, what we have in verses 3 through 14 Think about that. Verses 3 through 14, we have one sentence in the Greek. One long run-on sentence in the Greek. In the English, it's translated into many sentences, but in the Greek, it's one sentence. 202 words. One sentence. And the big idea that holds it all together is this, that you, the church of God, are blessed. That you, the church of God, have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And what are some of the blessings that we've talked about so far? That you, the church of God, have been blessed by being chosen before the foundations of the world to be his. Did you know that? Even before you were born, before the foundations of the world, he knew you and he chose you. That you, the church of God, have been blessed by being made blameless and holy in his sight. Did you guys know that? That when God looks at you, he sees you as holy and blameless. And not only that, that in Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He has brought us into his family, has adopted you, the church of God, as sons and daughters. And now God the king of the universe, he's your father, he's your daddy. We're gonna talk about two more blessings today in verses seven and eight. We're gonna concentrate on verses seven and eight today, but let's start reading in verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom, and insight. And so two more blessings. Do you see them? Paul tells us that we have been blessed with redemption and forgiveness. With redemption and forgiveness. That you, the church of God, are a redeemed people. That you, the church of God, are a forgiven people. And these are the two blessings that we're going to focus on today. But if we were to keep reading, Paul is going to continue to list more and more and more blessings that we have in Christ. And his whole point is this, that when you contemplate how blessed you are, when you contemplate the fact that you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ, that there ought to be a stirring that happens in your heart. That when you see that the result of these lavish blessings, right, it should produce in God's people a praise of his glorious grace, as verse 6 talks about. That there should be in us a praise of his glorious grace. That in light of all that God is for us in Christ Jesus, that we should be a people who are awestruck and overwhelmed by God's glorious grace towards us. And so let me ask you a question, church. Is there a to the praise of his glorious grace in you? Is there a to the praise of his glorious grace in you? Are you awestruck? Do you marvel? Is there such a desire to worship him for all the ways that he has blessed you in Christ? Is it in there? I think if many of us were honest today, I think the majority of us would say that we don't quite feel that that we don't quite feel that. That many of us in here, legitimately, we, we struggle to feel 
blessed by God, that we struggle to feel the desire to worship him with our everything, every moment, every day of our lives. I think many of us, if we were asked how we feel about God's grace towards us, we would say that we're thankful, we would say that we're happy, we would say that we're gl glad that God was gracious to us in this way, but there's not an amazement, there's not an astonishment, there's not a wonderment at what Jesus has done for us. I say that because I I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. And the question that I want us to ask today is, why is that? Why isn't there a, to the praise of his glorious grace inside of us? at least to the extent that there ought to be, right? I think one main reason, if not the greatest reason, as I thought about this for myself this week, is because we don't yet realize the depth of our own sin sinfulness. I don't yet realize the depth of my own sinfulness. We haven't yet truly realized the extent of our sinfulness. We haven't yet realized the extent of our rebellion, the extent of the deadness that we were in when God called us up, when God raised us to life, the extent of the darkness that we were in when he called us out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. We don't yet realize it. I think the one primary reason that there is no to the praise of his glorious grace in us is because we just don't think we're that sinful. We just don't think we're that bad. Sure, I have some flaws. Sure, I sin, mess up, just like everyone else. But there are plenty more people a lot worse than me. And so relatively speaking, I'm a pretty good person. And so are you. And we think of ourselves as pretty good people, and so when we hear that we've been redeemed, we think of ourselves as pretty good people, and so when we hear that we've been forgiven, we say, okay, God, thank you, but there's no amazement, there's no astonishment, there's no, oh my gosh, I can't believe it, can you believe it's true? It's not in here. So do you see the problem? Jesus said, if you've been forgiven much, you will love much. That if you've been forgiven much, you will love much. Or said in another way, you will only be able to worship to the extent that you realize how much you've been forgiven. You will only be able to worship to the extent that you realize how much you've been forgiven. But we don't think we've been forgiven all that much, and so our worship is little. So do you see why understanding our sinfulness is so key? But still, we don't feel we're all that bad. But you can't measure how sinful you are simply by how you feel. Because Jeremiah tells us, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So you can't measure the level of your guilt. You can't measure the depth of your sinfulness by how bad you feel because the Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitful. It lies to us. And so we have to measure it by what the Bible says. What the Bible says and what does the Bible say? Paul tells us that we were so sinful that we needed redemption. That we were so sinful that we needed redemption. Well, redemption, what does that mean? The word redemption in the Greek is the word apolutron, which also means ransom. It means ransom. And so when would you ever be in a position where a ransom has to be paid for you? Where would you ever be in a position where a ransom has to be paid for you? If you're in captivity, right? If you're in bondage. If you're in slavery, right? Paul is telling us that when it comes to our sin, we needed redemption. And so what is he saying? He's saying that sin, it held you in captivity. Sin, it held you in bondage. It held you in slavery, and it refused to let you go unless a ransom was paid. So the Bible often uses this slavery language when talking about the depth of our sinfulness. But today, we use the language of addiction. And I think it's helpful because for a lot of us, idea of slavery is a foreign concept, but I think we could understand what addiction means to communicate the same concept. Addiction and slavery, in a lot of ways, they parallel each other, okay? So think about this with me. Addiction is not just when you have a problem, but addiction is when the problem has you, right? 
Addiction isn't simply when you have a problem. Addiction is when the problem has you. Addiction is not just when you struggle here and there with drinking, but addiction is when the drinking has you. Addiction is not when you fail one night and look at pornography because your wife is out of town. Addiction is when the pornography has you. And when it comes to the depth of our sinfulness before Christ, before God saved us, the Bible is saying that sin isn't just something you had, sin is something that had you. Sin isn't just something that you had, it's something that had you. Sin isn't just something that you did every now and then and you needed help from. It's something that held you in captivity and it refused to let you go. You didn't have control over it, it had control over you. If sin was just something that you had, there would there'd be things that we could do to unhave it. If sin was just something that you had, there are things that we could do to unhave it with enough remorse, maybe, with enough feeling bad, with enough blaming others, maybe, with enough behavioral modification, maybe. We could have gotten rid of it, but sin wasn't just something that we had. Sin was something that had us, and it refused to let us go without a ransom. Some of you, you feel it even now. That old master still pulling you in, still demanding that you bow down and obey. And you realize that even you telling yourself that you're not that bad, and that you're a pretty good person. It's the way that you found to deal with how truly bad you actually are, right? This crushing guilt that sets in even if for one moment we stop telling ourselves that we're not that bad. But because we're created in God's image, right? When we sin, whether we'll admit it or not, deep inside we know it ought not to be this way. We know it deep inside. And so the crushing guilt comes in and we have to find a way to deal with the guilt. We have to find a way. And so here are some ways we try to deal with the guilt of our sin. All the ways that we try to feel the depth of our, all the ways that we try not to feel it. Try to numb it out, the depth of our, sin, our sinfulness. See if it sounds familiar. First way, you can deny it. You could deny it all together and say, you know, there's no really such thing as sin, there's no such thing as God, no such thing as sin. Or you blame somebody else, it's really not my fault, it's because of them, it's really their fault. Or you can excuse it, well you see there were some extenuating circumstances. Or you could diminish it, well it's not that big of a deal, I know people have done a lot worse. Or you can hide it, well I hope I don't get caught. Or you can punish yourself, I'll just feel really bad for it, I'll pay my penance. Or you could try to earn yourself out of it, I'll just do a bunch of good things and pay God back for the bad things I've done. And isn't it exhausting? Many of us, we've tried all of these things and maybe you're trying it right now and you're exhausted. Why? Because you're trying to be your own redeemer. You're trying to pay your own ransom. But what does God's word tell us in verse seven? In him, we have redemption through his blood. In him, we have redemption. In him, not in us, but in Christ there is redemption. And so there can be no redemption. Redemption is not possible in you covering it up. There can be no redemption in you as you blame others. There can be no redemption in you having enough, having enough remorse or in you doing better the next time. In fact, redemption can't be found in you at all. It's in him. Redemption can only be found in Christ, in what he has done. Redemption through his blood, verse 7 tells us. By the cross, Jesus' blood, his life was the ransom that was paid for your redemption. Nothing less than the blood of Jesus could set the captives free. Nothing less. So how do we deal with the depth of our own sinfulness? Well, in all kinds of ways, right? In all kinds of ways that at the end of the day fails us and makes us exhausted because we're trying to be our own redeemer. But there is another way. The Bible tells us there is another way. You can be forgiven. The Bible says you can be forgiven. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses. 
forgiveness. And forgiveness is another way that we can realize the depth of our sinfulness. You see, our need for redemption shows us the depth of our sinfulness. Our need to be purchased out of, ransomed out of the slavery and the addiction of sin. That sin isn't just a problem that we have, that we need, that we need help from, but that it holds us captive. That shows us the depth of our sins. But forgiveness is another way that we realize that the depth of our sinfulness. Well, how, how is that? What does forgiveness show us? Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great British pastor theologian, once said that the problem of forgiveness was the greatest problem that God had ever faced. He said that with all reverence, the problem of forgiveness was the greatest problem that God had ever faced. And so truly, with all reverence, understanding that nothing is impossible for God, that nothing is too difficult for him, this is what he meant. Just think about with me some of the greatest, the biggest problems that God has ever faced in human history. Well, first one, darkness, right? There's no light, nothing but darkness, that's, that's a problem. How did God deal with it? He simply said, let there be light, and there was light. There were no plants, there was no vegetation. Well, it's not a big problem for me. I don't like vegetables all that much, but I, I know there's a lot of kale lovers out there, okay? So it's a problem. How did God deal with it? He simply said, let the earth sprout vegetation, and it was so. There were no animals. Now, that's a problem for me. <laughs> that's a problem for me. I need, I need my hamburgers and steaks, you know? It's a problem. How did God deal with it? He simply said, let the earth give living creatures let the earth bring forth living creatures, and it was so. God looked down and he saw the loneliness of man. He looked down and he saw Adam and the brother was struggling, and so what did he do? He put him to sleep and took out one of his ribs and made woman. You see, that was just a creation account, but we could go on and on, and my point is this, that, that with all of these problems that God faced, God just spoke, let there be, or he took some quick little action and the problem was solved, but when it came to the problem of our sin, he couldn't just say, let there be forgiveness. He couldn't just do that. He couldn't just say, let there be forgiveness. Why not? The problem was too great. The depth of sin ran too deep. And so God had to do the unthinkable. He had to do the unimaginable. He had to tell his son, the second person in the Trinity, that son, this problem is so big and the ransom that needs to be paid is so great that you have to go to the cross. You have to die. Blood has to be shed. There is no other way. The cross of Jesus, the blood of Jesus being the only possible solution for our sin problem shows us the depth of the problem, right? The greatness of the solution that's being offered shows us the greatness of the problem, right? Do you agree? God wasn't overreacting here. He was exacting here doing exactly what was needed here. So both, our need for redemption and our need for forgiveness serve to show us the depth of our sinfulness. But when you see the lengths to which God has gone, when you realize how God had to lavish his son on us, how Jesus had to voluntarily be tormented and tortured and killed, all because forgiveness is a problem for him that's so great that it couldn't just be solved with the let there be. When you see that the problem was so big and the ransom to be paid was so unimaginable, the torturing, the death, and the blood of his own son, we might ask, then why did God go through with it? Why did God go through with it? I mean, it's good for us, we benefit from it. No complaints on our part, but why did God go through with it? It cost him so much. Why did he go through with it? Verse seven tells us, and hopefully you'll start to feel that to the praise of his glorious grace, start welling up in your heart. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So why did God go through with it? Because of the riches of his grace. You see, because of the riches of his holiness, God demanded the payment for sin. 
But because of the riches of his grace, he provided the payment for sin. Because of the riches of his holiness, he demanded the payment for our sin. He couldn't just let it go. Sin had to be paid for. But because of the riches of his grace, he himself provided that payment. He's both, fully both, and he's expressing both. You see, the greatest problem that our sin brought to God was this. How could the riches of his holiness coexist with the riches of his grace? How could it? How could God both demand the payment for sin because he's so holy, yet also provide forgiveness for our sins because he's so gracious? How could he do it? Let's read our text again. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So how did he do it? He did it with all wisdom and insight. He did it with all wisdom and insight. He planned the way. He determined the most wise way. He determined the most insightful way in which the holiness of God would not consume the sinfulness of his people. He has planned a way in which he could offer forgiveness to us, salvation to us, redemption to us in the wisest and the most insightful of, of ways. And what is that way of wisdom and insight? What is that way? It's the way of the cross. It's the way of the cross. As we look at the cross, what we're seeing is God's wisdom. As we look at the cross, what we're seeing is God's insight. There was no other way. There was no better way. This is it. It's the way of the cross, the cross in which we received redemption and forgiveness. Redemption and forgiveness. The thing that I don't want us to miss about redemption and forgiveness is this. I want us to see that redemption and forgiveness are two different things. Two different things, but they're inseparable. Redemption and forgiveness are two different things, but they're inseparable. In God's wisdom and insight, he saw that we needed both to be saved. And so Paul puts them right next to each other. He doesn't want redemption and forgiveness to be separated. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. One breath, right, put together. So why is the inseparability of redemption and forgiveness so important? It's important because, again, in the depth of our own sinfulness, we desperately want to separate it. In the depth of our sinfulness, we desperately want to separate it. In our sinfulness, we want the forgiveness, but not the redemption. We want the forgiveness, but not the redemption. You have, you have sin in your life. It's making you miserable because you were created in God's image. And you're trying all kinds of ways to deal with your guilt, right? But all these ways that's failing you, you're just exhausted. But then you hear that God offers you forgiveness. And so you want that forgiveness because forgiveness means the lifting of the guilt. Forgiveness means you don't have to feel bad anymore. You can move on with your life trying to live your happy little life. And so you want the forgiveness. Forgiveness is good, but what about redemption? But what about redemption? Remember what redemption means? It means that a ransom was paid for you. It means that you were bought out of slavery. If you were bought, if you were purchased, what does that mean? It means that you no longer belong to yourself. It means that you no longer belong to yourself. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. Do you, so do you even feel it now? If I were to say to you, God is offering you forgiveness. Whatever bad things you've done, he'll forgive you. We feel our hearts leap. But what if I, but, but what if I tell you at the cross God bought you? He owns you. You are not your own. How do you feel? Many of you, you want forgiveness, but not redemption. You want to be freed from the guilt of your sin, but you don't want to be told what to do. But you don't like the idea of being owned. You want your sins to be forgiven. You want to go to heaven, but you want to stay in control of your life. You want to date who you want to date, right? You want to treat your wife the way you want to treat her. You want to spend your money the way you want to spend it. You want to live your life the way that you want. You don't want somebody else telling you what to do. But here's the thing, either Jesus is king or he isn't. 
Either Jesus is king or he isn't. Either he is king and so he has the authority to forgive you. But what else does he have? He has the authority to tell you what to do because he's king. He has the authority to tell you to bow down because he's king. He has the authority to tell you and demand everything from you. Why? Because he's king. Or he's not. And so he doesn't have the authority and so go live the way that you want. Quit wasting your time here. If he's not king, go live the way that you want. Either he's king or he's not. We just can't pick and choose what he is. He's king or he's not. We see this in the Old Testament. A group of people that were in bondage as slaves. We see that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Remember, in the Old Testament, oftentimes, it's just a physical picture of our spiritual reality. God was delivering his people out of a physical slavery, showing us the kind of spiritual slavery he's delivering us out of. God sends Moses to set them free. And do you remember the famous saying of Moses to Pharaoh? What did he say? Let my people go. Let my people go, right? That's what Charlton Heston said. Let my people go. But did you know that's not what he said? Go back and read it. That's not what he said. That's not all that Moses said. God commanded Moses to say something more. He commanded Moses to say, let my people go so that they may serve me. Let my people go so that they may worship me. God isn't saying, let my people go so that they can go do whatever they want. But that's what we so desperately want, isn't it? That's the modern view of salvation. The modern view of freedom is not to have any Lord at all, choosing whatever you want. You're your own boss. You're your own God. You do whatever pleases you. And God does want you to be free. He does want you to be free from the guilt of your sins, but not just so that you no longer have to obey the slave masters in Egypt but so that you could obey him, so that you could worship him, so that you could serve him. And you may be thinking, well, that's not really good news at all, trading in one master for another, right? But sin no longer being your master, but now God being your master, it makes all the difference in the world. Why? Because he's a good master. Because he's a good master. If God rescued Israel out of Egypt, think about this. If God were to have rescued Israel out of Egypt and then just turned them over to themselves, he wouldn't have really rescued them. He would have just replaced one terrible master for another, right? You doing what you want, obeying only yourself for the rest of your life, it would only end in a horrific life. And if you don't think so, you're being foolish. Do you want to live in a world where you're the king? Do you want to really live in a world where you're the king? That's a terrible world. You don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in your world, right? <laughs> That's not the kind of salvation that God has in mind. Forgiveness without redemption is no salvation at all. And so do you see why redemption and forgiveness are inseparable? We can't have the freedom of forgiveness without giving the worship that redemption demands. Okay? It's not just let my people go, it's let my people go so that they may worship me. And so do you feel the depth of your own sinfulness now? Can you at least begin to feel it? Our need for redemption, the fact that sin isn't just something that we need help from, it's something that held us captive, right? The difficulty of forgiveness, that God couldn't just say, let there be forgiveness, but he had to send his son, his very son, to the cross for us. And our last ditch effort at staying in control by separating forgiveness from redemption, all of these serve to show us the very depth of our sinfulness. And why is the Bible so bent on showing us the depth of our sinfulness? Why does it talk about sin so much? Why do we have to preach about sin so much? Because do you remember the first day that you met Jesus? Do you remember that day when you first met Jesus? There was some sense of your sinfulness, right? There was some sense of your need for him. There was some, some sense of your need for the cross, sense enough for you to cry out to him, God, I need your forgiveness. God, I need you to save me. And our wishful thinking at that time was that 
we would grow in Christ, we, we would learn to love him in such a way that we would sin less and less and less, and so we would feel better about our sinfulness. But that's not what the gospel commands of us. That's not what the cross is demanding. The cross isn't demanding that we look at it just glancingly on the day of our salvation. The cross is demanding that we survey the cross, that we ponder and wonder, meditate on the cross, that we survey every square inch of the cross, and there at the cross see the very depth of our sinfulness by seeing the solution that was needed to deliver us out of our sin, by seeing the solution that was needed to forgive us for our sins. See, many of us, we want to skip the crucifixion and go straight to the resurrection, right? But we have to first be condemned by the cross before we can be saved by the cross. You guys see that picture of baptism? First, you have to be buried. First, you have to be willing to say, I'm a sinner, I deserve to die. You have to die first, and then you'll be raised to a new life. You have to first stand condemned by the cross before you can be saved by the cross. There is no resurrection apart from the crucifixion. And if you look at the cross long enough, you'll see a paradox set in your life. As you walk with Jesus for a period of time, you'll begin to see him change you. You will sin less. You will sin less. You'll sin less, but you'll feel more like a sinner than ever before. You guys testify to that? You'll sin less, your life looks a lot better now, but you'll feel more like a sinner than ever before. Why? Because you see now, better than ever before, how perfect Jesus actually is. Because you see better than ever before how truly beautiful, how perfectly righteous and holy Jesus actually is. And so in light of Jesus, you'll realize that you're a greater sinner than you ever thought. In light of Jesus, you'll realize that you're a greater sinner than you ever thought. But what else will you see? What else will you realize? That this Jesus, he's a greater savior than you ever dreamed. That he's a greater savior than you ever dreamed. We didn't know the depth of our own sinfulness, but he knew. And he still did what? He still went to the cross. He knew the very depth of your own sinfulness. He knew in all the ways that you would deny him. He knew all the ways that you would rebel against him, but he still, knowing it all, still went to the cross for you. You'll never see him to be a great savior if you don't see yourself to be a great sinner. You don't think Jesus is that great? It's because you don't think you're that bad. You'll never see him to be a great savior if you don't see yourself to be a great sinner. That's why the Bible is so bent on showing us the greatness of our sinfulness because the Bible is so bent on showing us the greatness of Jesus, how great he is, what a great savior he is. And so let's make that our goal and application today and for the rest of our lives. To look to the cross and to walk with Jesus in such a way that 10 years from now, we will have a greater sense of our sinfulness than we do today. And then 10 years from that point. And then 10 years from that point. And on and on until it's our dying day. And on our dying day, we have the greatest sense of our own sinfulness. But at the same time, what? the greatest sense of our Savior, Jesus, the greatest sense of God's glorious grace, and the greatest welling up of what? Of, to the praise of his glorious grace. What would that be like if on our dying day we would be able to offer him the greatest praise, the greatest welling up, greatest worship for his glorious grace to us? Let's pray together. Father, we need you to do that work. We don't want to see it. We, don't, we want to numb out how sinful we actually are, Lord. But you have planned this way of salvation and, and the greatest wisdom and the greatest insight that we will feel and know in the greatest way how great you are when we realize how bad we are, when we realize how sinful we are when we realize the very depth of our guilt and sinfulness before you. So we ask that you would do that work, and I know, for me, I will fight you all the way, that we, as a people, we don't want to see our sinfulness. We will fight you all the way. 
but as a good daddy, Lord, that does things that are good for us even though we don't like it. We ask that you would show us the very depths of our sinfulness because we truly want to offer you the praise that you are due for your glorious grace expressed to us in Christ Jesus. And it's his name that we pray. Amen.